Well, we welcome everybody who joins us now, streaming on Facebook and YouTube. And um, we'll put on the screen there a number of places you can find us. Of course, now that we found that we are also available on speakfaith.tv slash fire tv which is the amazon channel so there's like a potential another 40 million people that could view us on amazon and uh, only god will be able to make the connection for people you know so that they would find us and you know but he's the great promoter if there's something good and somebody that needs to hear this he'll make sure there's a connection because i believe god wants people to walk in victory in life and so uh, we are about ready to, um, oh, and I just should mention also that we archive all of these programs on our website, and you can just go to vinehealing.faith and uh, find any one of these. Now, I've changed the name of the program. Uh, this is the night I'm going to make the official announcement. This is now called Dominion in Life. And so for the whole year, I just kept coming up with, you know, Dominion in Life through and I realize I will never exhaust this. So it's always it's just going to be just a dominion in life. And then there'll be an additional part to the title. So tonight, our title is Dominion in Life Through Overcoming a Crisis. Now, why would I say that? You know, we're faith people. I thought some people would say, I thought once you had faith, you're done with crisis. <laughs> Let me tell you what I heard Kenneth E. Hagan say, probably in a number of the... Uh, classes that I was at healing school with him uh, or in some of the classes. I'm not sure I read it in any of the books, but I do know he said to us, the crisis of life comes to everyone. How you respond will determine your victory. So the crisis is going to come to everybody. And I can tell you the biggest names in ministry and the biggest names that are out there promoting faith in God, faith in his word, have had the greatest opposition of the devil. And I know that Kenneth Hagin faced crisis of life. Kenneth Copeland faces crisis of life. It comes to everyone. Now, you know, there's some certain crisis in life. You go, well, that's just natural. That's going to happen. You know, you have elderly parents, and eventually your parents are going to graduate and go to heaven. Praise God, hoping that they're Christians. My parents were Christians, and they graduated and went to heaven. And... Um, you know, so it did create some crisis. I mean, my mom was always telling me, you know, your dad's going to die because he had Alzheimer's and she was his caregiver. And every time I'd see her, she'd tell me, you know, your dad is dying. I said, I know, mom. And so am I. And so are you. And so we are. But not today. OK, so just not today. And then I get a call one morning. My mom died. She actually died three years before my dad did. Before she died, she says, now, Unfortunately, you kids, whenever we die, you're going to inherit a nightmare. You're going to inherit, an, inherit a, a, a problem, she says, because I haven't been able to take care of all the business and everything. Well, I was the, the person who had to do all of that after they passed away, and I had to take care of my dad for another three years because he lived, outlived her by three years, and he, even though he had Alzheimer's. He almost got to 90. But, um, and it was really interesting because my mom died, even though it was a crisis in life. I mean, it was shocking moment that day but um she died on june the 11th uh, 2013 and my dad who had alzheimer's and didn't know anything about who we were who he was cl clocks calendars nothing he died exactly on june the 11th 2016 three years to the day and the hour that my mom died and that to me was a sign from heaven everything's good my dad's got his memories back they're probably running the streets of gold together like kids. <laughs> and, um, and so you get a, you know, there's no reason, even though a crisis in life comes, even if it's something like the death in the family, for us to go into a grieving if they're believers. Now, it certainly would be tough. Praise God. All of our family members are now Christians, you know, so I'm not going to expect any close family members, you know, ever to be a something like that. But still, it's a, it's a disruption. And in many people's lives, it's like for sure, you're not supposed to ever bury your children. That's just not supposed to happen, but it does. And so it's just a, a, one of those things that you can't even, it's an unbearable crisis. But I know that when people face crisis in life, you have to understand Jesus warned us about this in advance. You say, wait a minute, Jesus, you're the one who's going to show us how to navigate all this and, and how to be successful 
in fulfilling what you've called us to do. But he told us in John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Well, that's good. That's good news to know that Jesus is going to speak to us and we can have peace because in the world you're going to have tribulation. <laughs> crisis. Tribulation is crisis. But he says you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, he wasn't bragging. He overcame and we were not going to be able to overcome. He's saying, I overcame and I'm giving you authority and dominion in life, so you're going to overcome. And so he says, now you can be of good cheer because I'm going to give you the way to have the victory in everything that you would face. Like I said, there's just many things that are going to come along that you're going to say, wow, who knew? Well, I take things personally when the devil attacks people that I know, especially staff. So, you know, I go to extra prayer. I just remember Brother Hagin always saying, well, sometimes you're going to see something come up and you're not going to know what to do. So my suggestion is double up. Double up in prayer, double up in the Word, <laughs> get in the Spirit, and you're going to find the answers and the solution. And uh, right now we have a staff member who is going through a crisis, and you'll all be hearing about it because they opened up a GoFundMe page to help them out. But we have a staff member who's got a three-year-old daughter who was just diagnosed with cancer and starting chemo today. They're putting the board in right now. So again, that's something that would rattle people. However, we have a prognosis that by the stripes of Jesus, she was healed. She is going to live and not die. She's going to fulfill all the days of her life. And we're going to surround this little girl with faith and prayer. And we're going to guarantee that she's going to make it all the way through. Even the treatments and everything else, it's going to be the hand of the Lord on her in the process of all of this, so she's going to come out the other side. But I know that suddenly when I started getting, even I didn't even have a diagnosis yet, but the Lord had me up at 5 o'clock this morning. I thought I could go back and get another little snooze, but it wasn't going to happen. So, you know, you go to prayer. And then throughout the day, I just was drawn into prayer. And finally I get the diagnosis. Well, I kind of, my spirit knew, my spirit knew this was a crisis in life that they were facing and that we needed to surround them with prayer, and especially this little girl, because she's the one who's going to have to go through everything. It's probably harder on the parents. I mean, I know that is. You know, just if, if anything happens to your child, you would say, Lord, I would swap. Let it happen to me, not them. You know, because you just, you don't want them to go through anything. Anyway, so how are we going to look at this? I, I, I just read to you from John chapter 16, verse 33, the words of Jesus. Well, that's where you first go. He says, you're going to have tribulation in this life. I wish I could extract you out of it, but I'd have to take you to heaven to do that. I've got to leave you here. And it, it, read John 17 and all the prayer he prayed for us. Lord, don't take them out of the world, but keep them strong. Keep them in unity. You know, let them be glorified in all that they're doing so that we can be glorified in them. You know, keep this unity of the faith with them. And so he, he even prayed for us who were going to listen to according to his original disciples' word. Bless those that believe according to the word that I've preached to my disciples who became his apostles. And so you go to the words of Jesus first, but how about Jesus' half-brother, James? The Apostle James. Let's go to James. Now, when I go to James, you're going to go, oh, I don't like the way James starts this off. But you're going to find it's in the same vein. He's trying to warn us about how to navigate this life because we have a lot of demonic opposition. That's what the Lord is letting us know. There's going to be a lot of demonic opposition. And the longer we go, the longer I live, the more I see the demonic opposition is getting, Satan's just getting frantic. He's not getting more powerful. He's getting frantic because his, his day of judgment is coming closer and closer. But anyway, James says this in James chapter one, verse two, I'm starting just <clears throat> reading in the NKJV. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, trials, <laughs> crisis, temptations, tribulations, all those things are talking about the crisis in life. And some of them are going to be opposition against you as far as the word of God and the stand you've made. Some of them will be opposition in life and the, and the affairs of life. But he says, when you come into these various trials, you need to count it all joy because you're going to find out God's got a victory built into the whole thing for you. Now, he didn't plan the problem. He didn't plan, plan the trial. 
But in the midst of it, he's got a solution that's going to cause you to come out on the other side better than you were when you went through the trial. So he says this, knowing this, that the testing of your faith. See, that's what the devil's after. He's after our faith. We're going to find out it's going to require faith to be able to face every one of these trials or crisis and come out well on the other side. The testing of our faith will produce patience. That's that word I hate more than any other word in the Bible, patience, you know. It's like because I found out when I asked and prayed and asked the Lord to give me patience, he decided not to give me patience. He's just decided to wear my reactor out so that it forced me to gain patience, you know. So, but you learn that all these trials of life will actually produce that patience. And um, I used to think, I, it was funny because I used to work as a, carpenter for when I first got saved and working with my dad who was a carpenter and um, and so I was working with these these other carpenters on this union job downtown one time and uh, and this carpenter was watching me he says man he says for a young man you've got a lot of patience he's I didn't have patience like that when I was young well I didn't know I had patience he was watching me trying to fix something it was like you know and and he knew it was like a tricky thing and and I beat it you know <laughs> but I stuck with it till I got it and uh, now I think I probably did have more patience when I, young, when I was young. I think the older I get, the less patient. <laughs> it's because like, I am tired of this patience lesson. You know, okay, let's just get over it. You know, but I don't want to graduate to heaven yet. I'm not done yet. So I'm learning that the testing of my faith is going to produce patience. And the patience will have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And that's really where we want to get to. Where in the reality, we do have patience. We do have patience with others. You have to learn to have patience with yourself. How many of you know forgiving yourself and having patience with yourself is two of the hardest assignments in life? You know, because we are our own worst enemies. You know? And so we have to understand that we, we, we want to train ourselves to not get in our way. You know, so that takes some renewing of the mind. It takes a lot of time with the Lord and in the Word and keeping our hand to the plow, you know, so that we come to that place where we see what's, what James is telling us. Now here, if you come up to anything, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Well, praise God, wisdom, the wisdom from God is, is really basically the solution to all things. Solomon says the principal thing is wisdom. So get wisdom. <laughs> Get the wisdom of God, which is going to be knowing that there is an answer on its way, even if you don't have the answer yet. Knowing that if you stick with him, go through this patiently or whatever, you'll get the wisdom of God to be able to come out on the other side victorious. So, James, great source for us to go to. Uh, we have somebody else we want to go to. How about Jude, the other half-brother that we have a, a letter from? Now, Jude is going to address something that uh, has to do with really a lot of error, doctrinal error in the church. And, um, <clears throat> and so he's going to talk about a different opposition that comes to us. But it says this, in Jude chapter, there's only one chapter in Jude, but um, a little short, short Bible, right before Revelation. But anyway, I think, I bet Jude had so much more to say. But he just thought, you know, I've got this one thing that I know God has anointed me to get across to the body of Christ to write this letter and get it across. But, you know, you think about it. Okay, these guys live with Jesus more than the apostles did, more than the disciples. You know, James worked with him probably for 18 years side by side. Jude was younger. As a matter of fact, he was the youngest brother, I believe. And so, you know, maybe... 12 or 13 years, but, but you know Jesus was talking to his family all the time, because by the time he was 12, he had figured out from the Word of God and by the anointing of the Spirit of God, he was the Messiah. He knew what his assignment was. He knew he wasn't going to step into it when he was 30 years old. He says, man, I'm going to practice on my brothers. You know, these guys are a captive audience. They have, to, I, they can't leave. They have to keep working with me, especially when he was the boss after his father died, and they had to keep working with me. So he's teaching them the Word of God, but they did not understand his mission that he came to die for the human race. You can't really get that across to your brothers. And they didn't even believe in his ministry when he launched out. They were angry because he left the family business and suddenly they got to run the thing. <laughs> but then upon his resurrection, he made sure. 
he showed himself to Peter and to James. Then somewhere along the line, Jew got in, in a, and they knew. You know, they were all there on the day of Pentecost. Every single one of them got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them was praying in tongues. His brothers and sisters and his mom. You know, so the whole family's there. They're all charged up. Now they're seasoned in ministry. And Jude has this to say. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. See, he was, you know, I was diligent to write to you. So I had to make myself do this because I knew God had a word for me to give and share with you. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. That is one of the most succinct statements in the Bible you're ever going to find. We have to contend earnestly for the faith. Now, what is it to contend earnestly for the faith? People say, oh, the faith, uh, you know, we, we, we are we're adherents to the faith, the faith in Jesus. No, he's talking about absolutely contend earnestly for faith. <laughs> it's the faith that's going to keep us strong in everything. But he says, your own faith, you're going to have to contend earnestly for it to all get all the job done that it is assigned to you to be able to do. He says, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It was the faith in Christ Jesus, faith in his word, faith in his promises, and standing on those promises until you see them manifest because you, every single believer has an assignment from God. And you can't, you can't really achieve that assignment without faith. That's why so many Christians are going to stand before the Lord one day and he's going to say, what did you do with I, the calling that I placed on, their life, on your life? And they're going to go, what calling? I just went to church. I didn't know there was a calling. He says, yeah, I would like to be able to tell you, well done, good and faithful servant, but you never even inquired of me. Why did I put you on the planet? And so we know, for those of us who know these things, we realize we have to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to all the saints. All the saints were called into the same faith and the same purposes of God. Now, <clears throat> Let me just jump real quick from verse 3 over to verse 20 and verse 21. Because he says this at the end of his letter, building, but, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of, I've, I read after different, you know, philosophers, Christian philosophers all the time. And there's so many, if they've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit because they have resisted it because they think it's passed away as demonic. If they ever tell you, it's anybody who prays in tongues of the devil, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's never forgiven, this age or the next age. So I pray that they're not doing that. But some of them just refuse. And so when they say, praying in the Holy Spirit, they say, well, that's not praying in tongues. That's just definitely not praying in tongues. <laughs> they're saying, you no, know, every one of us have the Spirit of God. Yes, in your spirit. But I want the Holy Spirit in my soul. I want the Holy Spirit in my body. I found out he took up residence in me. The spirit of holiness lives in there. And I need to yield to everything that he has. Well, if you find out when you have an assignment, your healing is inside of you in the, the spirit of holiness. Your provision is inside of you in the spirit of holiness. Your direction, the wisdom you need, is inside of you. You say everything is in there, but it's just not automatically in your mind until your mind has been renewed to the Word of God. And part of the renewing of the mind doesn't come until you get baptized in the Holy Spirit because Jesus says, don't go out there without the power. That's where the power comes from. James is saying, when you're praying in tongues, you're praying in the Spirit, and you're building yourself up on your most holy faith, it's when you're praying in tongues that the Word that you have studied suddenly comes alive. It becomes real. And you start realizing it's almost like seeing in the spirit. You know, it's like right now I'm looking at all of you and, and suddenly there's, a, there's sometimes different times in a service. That I get into the service and I, it's like everything, so you guys start turning hazy. <laughs> and I start seeing things, just future things. Sometimes you see angelic you, or you're sensing angelic presence. Guess what? Every single one of us has an angel here. And probably some of us have assignments where angels are calling other angels in. So we probably have twice as many people, angels in here as we have people. So you start getting sensitive to those things. But anyway, you start seeing 
faith things. Things in the Spirit are things that God is directing you toward, and you see that by faith as a future thing. And you say, that's going to come to pass. That's given by God. He's showing me the future. I attach my faith to that spiritual thing that I see by faith, and that's what's going to come to pass because that's the will of God that's being re revealed to me by wisdom. He says, so you build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. See, when you're looking for the mercy of our Lord, you realize he's positioned you as a walking evangelism machine. <laughs> if somebody can get to you, they can go to heaven for eternity. And you run into people every single day that don't know the Lord. That's why we have to be in the Spirit. You have to be prayed up and in the Word and saying, Lord, any assignment you have. If I bump into somebody and you want me to speak something to them, listen, for one thing, you carry the anointing. You could bump into somebody and the power of God could hit them. And that's the perfect time to say, I feel like the Lord wants me to ask you a question. Is that okay? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a perfect way to start a conversation with somebody. I feel like I need to ask you a question. Is that okay? Then you can explain to them, because I was prompted by the Lord. Do you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead? I mean, just go ahead, find out, locate them where they're at, find out if they were ever in church, if they were ever heard the gospel that God raised Jesus from the dead. And some people will tell you, well, yeah, I heard that in church as a kid. Now that's getting more and more rare. The older I get, the more I get out there and ask people, do you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead? You find out people were not raised in church. They've never even heard. They've never, I mean, they have been so cut off from the truth, because just like in so many foreign lands forever, people had never heard the gospel. Well, right here in our own land, our own nation, it's like becoming a foreign land that people have never really heard the gospel because Satan has made sure they were always caught up with everything that's a distraction. And, and churches basically emptied out and so many of them never came in. You know, there are churches after the COVID-19 that they said, we don't expect to ever see half of our church ever come back again because they got used to staying home. Now, are they watching the service while they're staying home? No, they fool the church and they say, go ahead and send an offering in. <laughs> and they say, oh, well, they're still part of us. They're probably not tuning in. <laughs> they got lazy. And now what happens in their homes? Well, the children are not raised, raised around the word or whatever, and they don't hear anything. They probably stop. They just get out of the habit of discussing the word at the house or the Lord's will or just bringing up the name of the Lord at all. So what do we have to do? We have to just say, Lord, I'm going to contend. I'm going to contend for the faith. I'm going to be one of those who's just going to be in the spirit and I just have me bump into somebody, just point out anybody because I'll, be I'll be your walking evangelist every day because I'm going to go, okay, today I'm going to go into Home Depot. Well, there's going to be some unsaved people in Home Depot. I can guarantee it. <laughs> Today, I got to go to the grocery store. Okay, I'm guaranteeing half the people in the store are not going to be saved. So the opportunity is around us at all times. And so you say, well, yeah, but people are busy. They're shopping. They're saying, you know what? I found out if you just talk to people nicely sometimes and just make some nice comment about something they're doing or something they're wearing. I like people's shoes sometimes. Man, I like your shoes. Because I was a meeting. No, it wasn't a meeting. Where was I recently? Oh, oh, actually, it was the uh, Michael Buble concert. I, okay, sorry. It was there last Saturday night. Anyway, and the strangest thing, I'm standing there in the bathroom, and I just happened to look down, and I noticed this guy's shoes, and they're identical to mine. <laughs> so, and then, so I go have and wash my hands. He comes up and standing right next to me. I said, hey, I like your shoes. I stuck my foot out there. He says, yeah, yeah. I was you. So, you know, anything, I'm always looking for anything to be able to say something to somebody and, and just be a normal person. And guess what? They're normal people. They're just unsaved. And they're primed for getting to be saved as soon as somebody's nice to them and is just going to talk to them like a regular person, like, like maybe you've known them your whole life. <laughs> so God will make these connections. Well, that's what he's saying. Keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy to be extended to other people of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, 
Jude was dealing with false doctrine. So let's go back to where we left off in verse 3. So at verse 4 he says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed. These are false doctrine people. They've crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our Lord God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They turned the gospel into lewdness. In other words, they believe in a greasy grace. It doesn't matter. You know, all your sins are forgiven from the past, present, and future, so it doesn't matter how we live. And some of them are in the pulpit. And they're preaching from the pulpit. It doesn't matter how you live because you're forgiven in Christ. They've turned it into lewdness. And I see more of it today than I've ever seen in my whole life, and it's shocking. I don't even want to look, but, you know, you almost can't hide from it. It's just everywhere. Then we have the thing in the big news, you know, big fall of the biggest pastor in New York City and stuff, you know, so because they're living in lewdness. And, and that's the greasy grace they believe. Well, once all your sins are forgiven, doesn't even matter if you keep sinning. What are they going to have to say before Jesus when they stand before him? He's going to say, well, wanted to say well done, but I just have to say, well, you did a pathetic job. <laughs> Verse 5 says this, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. He saves them out of Egypt and wants to take them into the promised land, but they're already stiff-necked and rebellious enough to say, we want to go back. We don't like just water and manna. <laughs> we had quail. God says, okay, I'll give you quail. He, there's so much quail, they almost choked to death on the quail. They wanted to go back. We had leeches, leeks. It's not leeches. They didn't eat leeches. But it looks like leeches, leeks and onions. I don't know. I don't even like onions. I'm sure I wouldn't like leeks because it just <laughs> looks like leeches. I'm not going to eat a leech. <laughs> they wanted to go back to Egypt. God says, all your carcasses are going to die here in the wilderness. Only those under the age of 20, after they grow up, will go in with Joshua and Caleb, who were the, you know, they went in to spy out the land. They came in, we're more than able to take them. What do you mean? Like, you know, grasshoppers in their eyes. God's given us this land. They're grasshoppers in our eyes. I don't care how tall they are. You know, it's like David with the giant, you know. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? This guy doesn't have a covenant with God. I don't care how tall he is. I'll take him out with my slingshot. It's like, People who believe in God and his covenant word, they're not moved by those things that they see. So I'm going in, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to get the victory. I don't care what crisis comes along. And I know Jesus warned me there's always going to be a crisis. How I many of you have almost found out you can almost have a daily crisis? <laughs> I can tell you that because we run the ministry. We always have a daily crisis. <laughs> there's something every day. <laughs> I'm going to get tickled here in a second. <laughs> Why? Because I count it all joy whenever I, I encounter these various crises. So anyway, he says, and uh, verse 6, he says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. He's talking about those where he says the sons of God who were fallen angels that were here on the earth, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they were able to procreate with them and have children who became the giants. So these fallen angels, he said, they left, they left their proper domain. And they says they went after strange flesh because they were angels, these were humans, and there's strange flesh to them. Then he goes on, he says, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner went after strange flesh because they went after those of the same sex. It's all through the Bible. People say, oh, that's hate speech when you preach the Bible. I'm just going by what God says. He, he created them, male and female, he created them, gave them dominion and blessed them. He says, here's how it will work. <laughs> Stick with the plan. <clears throat> 
He says, in a similar manner, these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's not God getting vengeance. He spoke his word against Satan and he created hell fire for him. He actually took it out of him, took it out of his midst and created hell fire out of, you say, where did God get hell fire? He took it out of Satan after he fell. He was Hallel one of three archangels, he fell and God pulls the fire and he's got this fire down there waiting for him. Satan's not in hell yet. And he's not going to be run into place when he gets there. People have the goofiest ideas. He's going to be down there with a pitchfork and a you know, red tail and he's going to be, you know, he's not in charge. He's going to be in the lowest part doing the worst suffering. Glory to God. <laughs> if there's anybody who deserves the worst suffering, it's Satan who's caused all this. So there's going to be levels in hell. Dante's Inferno may not be all that far off. Who knows? But we do know this. God spoke it. He spoke his Satan's judgment. He didn't intend for humans to go there. But after the fall, that's where they were headed, judged by the word. So, you know, the gospel that we preach is all good news. God has redeemed everybody who will receive Jesus as Lord from the bad place. I don't believe the bad place is there. Do you don't want to find out? By first-hand knowledge. That's why I say, man, I'll, I'll pray for anybody who's died real recently that the people don't think that they knew the Lord because they want to come back. They're close enough to the gates of hell and the fire that they would want to come back and get saved. Praying for Christians, especially older Christians, and you're trying to compete with Jesus, and they're probably seeing Jesus face-to-face -face already, or they're, they're being caught up with a, a dozen angels that are carrying them up to Jesus. How are you going to compete with that? They don't want to come back. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like, you see me drop over, don't try to bring me back. I'm not coming back. That would be my appointed time. <laughs> I would claim it as that. <laughs> I'm not going ahead of that time because it's going to be after 100. I know that. Don't you know God gives us revelation of certain things, you know? And so he gives you a mark to shoot from. So from the day I got saved, I knew I'm going to live to be 105. I don't know why. Just knew. And that was minimum. That's the, I have to hit that mark or I'm not done yet. So if I ever go before then, you say, he didn't hit the finish line. What happened to him? I don't know, but I mean, that's what I'm shooting for, that finish line. Anyway, how about let's go to the Apostle Paul. So we look at Jesus, Jude, and James and Jude, and the Apostle Paul. Paul has some great things to tell us about temptations and trials. <laughs> now, what I want to point out to you is that, again, as Brother Hagin says, the crisis in life comes to everybody. And so, but a lot of people, it's, it's funny because, you know, a lot of Christians, when they started learning faith, they said, well, that's it. We got faith. We, we don't, we're never have to suffer anything ever again. We're always going to have all the money. We're always going to, well, potentially, you can always have all the provision. You can have all the healing because it's on the inside of you, in your spirit, where the Holy Spirit dwells. And that power is able to keep producing all of that as you learn how to come in agreement, alignment with God and his word and, and just be in that place of prayer and receiving. But, uh, you know, even though we're positioned that way, a lot of people thought, well, that's it. We're done with all the t tests and trials and everything. Like Jesus' words didn't mean anything. to his <laughs> In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Listen, that became my theme. That's the verse I got saved after I read it in the Bible and Jesus spoke to me. And I was an unsaved, drug-addicted, alcoholic, rock and roll drummer at the time. But he got me to read the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke got to John 16, 33, read those words. Afterwards, Jesus spoke to me, says, Doug, I'm alive. I'm the Lord. No, that did it. That was, I felt like the Apostle Paul after I read his story. I said, that was what I experienced. Who are you, Lord? I'm not the Lord. It's Jesus. Oh, my gosh. It's got on my head. Got out of my bed, got on my knees. Lord, I surrender. I, don't even, I didn't even know how to pray. Lord, I, could you just take over? I just, I don't know how to do this. So he was setting me up. <laughs> In this world, you're going to have tribulation. You know, he wanted me to know up front that there was going to be some opposition to everything. So, I, you know, I knew that going in, it was going to be that way. But some people say, well, the sign of really being in faith now is when you really have turned all those things back and, you, you know, it's obvious the person that's in the center of God's perfect will, everything's going totally smooth. There's no more problems. 
Well, if that's the case, then the poor old Apostle Paul never ever did get into the perfect will of God because he had nothing but problems. So he, he gives us a list of those things here in 2 Corinthians. Now he says this, <clears throat> he's, having to give, he's having to defend his apostleship to the Corinthians. You know, he's the one who preached the gospel to them to, to start with. They all got saved because he was the evangelist who came to them. They didn't realize an apostle can do the work of an evangelist. So he did the evangelism. Then he pastored them, got them established in the word, was their teacher. You know, then he had to move on, but he's writing back to them and says, you're my children. He says, and you're letting these false apostles come in and lead you astray. So he's having to defend his apostleship. So he says uh, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 22, he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Yes, I am more in labors. Now listen, this, this goes on for, uh, from verse 23 to verse 30. I just numbered the whole thing today. Can I just give you, there's 26 things he named here that he's experienced in opposition or crisis of life. So I'm going to go down real quickly here for you. Labors, multiple times. Stripes, multiple times. Prisons, multiple times. Death, multiple times, or deaths. 39 stripes, five times. Now, that's 195 times. That's if he was being whipped with a whip. Now, see, that when the Jews whipped somebody, some reason there was a belief that at 40 stripes, anybody could die. And so they would limit it, and they'd just go to 39, as Paul even said. 40 stripes minus one, five times. It turns out, if you track through the book of Acts, it, all these things were not elaborated there. So he experienced a lot of those things in other situations. Remember when he been, went back home to Tarsus? His father was the head of the synagogue in Tarsus. Many of the things he described here, he might have experienced and suffered under his father's order because he was an outcast because he'd received Christ. His father was one of the Jewish leaders who had raised his son to be one of the council of the Sanhedrin, one of the rulers of, of Israel, 100 rulers of it. And Paul, Paul was one of those. He'd done everything necessary. He was one of those Benjamites who, you know, had done everything perfectly. And that's why God said, he's got such a deal, zeal for the, the word of God. We can turn this guy. And Jesus shows up and sure enough, he instantly, who are you, Lord? And he gets turned and he becomes the apostle who could interpret everything from the Old Testament and tell us what it really meant for the new covenant. So that's why he called it my gospel. It's the Pauline revelation, the Pauline gospel that we study that we realize nobody else understood this. The other apostles are studying Paul's writings and catching, trying to catch up with everything he knows. It's been revealed to him, trances, visions, even dying and going to heaven and coming back. All these things that he experienced and hearing from the Lord Jesus all the time. Well, so he says this, 39 stripes, five times, 100, 195. Now, if there were more than, if, if it was just more than a single whip, because it could have been one stripe for every single of the 30, what, five times 39, it's 100, 195 scars on his back. If it was more than that, it's in the three, four, five hundred number of scars across his back that he bore. But he knew, realized when Jesus went through the beating that he was, he says, I'm not suffering what he suffered. There's no way. He bore our sins. I can certainly put up with this in order to fulfill what he's called. Whatever he tapped me for, that's what I'm going to get done. You know, he had a purpose in my life. He laid hold of me for that. I'm going to lay hold of that purpose. So he says, those stripes Five times. Rods, beaten with rods three times. So you know he had more scars on his back from that. He was stoned to death once. Oh my gosh. Shipwrecked three times. In the sea, the deep sea, a whole day and a whole night. Journeys, multiple times. Perils of water, multiple times. Perils of robbers, multiple times. Perils of the Jews, multiple times. Perils, perils of the Gentiles, multiple times. Perils in the city, all the time. Perils in the country all the time. Perils at sea. See, the sea. You know, they had to travel by sea to get a lot of distance without having to do a lot of walking. So Paul did that as much as he could, but there was a lot of perils in the sea. Perils of the false brethren, multiple times. Uh, in weariness and toil, 
the perils of weariness and toil, and perils of sleeplessness. And he goes on to say, hunger often, fasting often, cold often. Nakedness just mean not enough clothes when you're that really cold. And on top of that, the prayer burden for all the churches and every disciple that came into the kingdom under my purview. He says, listen, it's not an easy job. It's not a job for cowards. Actually, being a Christian is not really a job for cowards. That's what you find out. We're going to have to face these crises in life. We're going to have to do them in faith. So, from I just I wanted to give you some victory scriptures. <laughs> After telling you we got to be built up in faith, there's only me gives you some victory scriptures that I just wanted to go through and pull these out. So I'm starting from Old Testament, going all the way to the to the end. Genesis to maps, no. Deuteronomy is where I'm starting. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4 said this, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. <laughs> I mean, that means every battle you're ever going to face, God is with you and he's going to fight your enemies. You do it in the spirit. If you do it in faith, you're going to have his victory given to you every single time you go along. Now, David had this incredible praise of God, basically a psalm that was written really in the middle of 1 Chronicles, verse 29. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is heaven in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, you are, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand, it is to make great and to give strength to all. <laughs> I love David. When David starts prophesying, man, he, he just wrote down the most exhortation of praise to God for us to just tap into and say, yeah, yeah, that's my God. <laughs> He's the one who does all of that. Thank God that you saw that. You wrote it down. I come into agreement with and alignment with that. I'm going to get the fruit of that in my life. How about this one from Psalm 98? Song of praise to the Lord for his salvation and his judgment. He says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has re uh, revealed in the sight of the nations. Praise God. We're living in that righteousness. And we're the small remnant on the planet. I mean... You know, even if there's a billion Christians that are actually born again Christians, there's a billion who claim to be Christians. We don't even know if there's, a, there's seven and a half billion people on the planet. We are in the minority. You know, there was a point in time when 80% of the people in the population in America, when it was a very small population, all confessed Jesus as Lord. That was our establishing. But today, you're not going to find any 80% that are born again. As soon as I got born, born again, I realized, ooh, I just stepped into the real small minority. We're a small number because I know I was still playing in the nightclubs and said, these people are not Christians. I can tell. <laughs> I, can, I know they're not Christians. <laughs> they live just like I did before I was a Christian and they are, they are not one of us. <laughs> but, you know, I noticed this. that I, I lived in Miami right before I got saved. And, and I, I, uh, I noticed it's the strangest thing. I would go into the nightclub. I mean, to the, the, my only time after the nightclub, sometimes we worked till five o'clock in the morning in Dania, Florida, and we'd drive back up home. So I'd go to the night, to the grocery store sometimes six o'clock in the morning, maybe five o'clock sometimes, sometimes three or four. And walking through the grocery store, I could tell any, every person in there that was stoned. You know, stoners, no stoners. I mean, that's just the weirdest thing. Then I come back to Tampa and I get saved. Then I go into the grocery store in the middle of the day and I can spot all the Christians. You know, it's just that you're kindred spirits with people. And once you're born again, it's like, man, I was just so happy to be clean and washed in the blood of the Lamb. People say, yeah, you were brainwashed. My dirty old brain needed a good scrub. So I was brainwashed and clean, and it, I could spot other brainwashed, clean people. <laughs> you know, we just, we're a great group together. Hallelujah. How about in Isaiah? Oh, my gosh. The Messianic prophet. He says this. In uh Isaiah 25, 
at verse 8, he says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all the faces and rebuke uh, the rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So all the rebuke against us, all the opposition, you know, as far as religious persecution and everything else, God's going to settle the score. One day it's all going to be settled, and you're going to be in heaven with God, and those who cursed you and thought you were a religious, hateful person because you've told the truth out of the Word of God, trying to help people. Like I said, sometimes we have to be Holy Ghost paramedics. Got to hurt people before you can help them. <laughs> Speak the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. So, but it's, well, it's always the truth. And it's only the truth that will set you free. And only the true disciples discover that truth and get set free by that truth. Then how about, let's go over to the New Testament. Matthew um, chapter 12. And of course, this is... Uh, Jesus ministering, he says, uh, the Isaiah, the prophet, spoke this concerning Jesus, and it starts in verse 18 of chapter 12. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name Gentiles will trust. We are the Gentiles who trusted. He came unto his own, his own did not know him. They knew him not. But he also was so kind to all of them and everything. Only, only to the money changers in the temple did he ever drive out with a whip. It's the only people I saw that he was with. But he did speak to all these people and call them whitewashed walls and you know, vipers and hypocrites and everything. He was, had to hurt them, try, try to help them because he had to tell them the truth. They were locked in religion and they were not seeing the plan and the grace of God, the mercy of God through the gospel. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Whew. Glory to God. <laughs> Isaiah prophesied that. And, and it, the church was getting it. Paul got it. He says, let me extract from the Old Testament prophets, what he was saying. We experienced him. He came. The one that they were prophesying about the Messiah, he did come. And he was raised from the dead. Don't look for another Messiah. The one that was raised from the dead is good enough. He's the Messiah. With everything. He will give us everything with all that he has because he gave us Jesus. Well, how about, I just have two more verses of Scripture that we're going to pray. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 13 says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 13, Therefore, taking the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, keep standing. Praise God, the devil cannot take you down. You're the one who's still standing at the end of the battle when all the dust settles and everything. There you are still standing, and you've got your foot on the devil's neck as he's on the ground and you're in that place. We have to see that that's how we're going to come through every single crisis. There's many crises. Some of them you're going to say, wow, you know, that's just got to be, you know, it's going to be tough to overcome. And some people even think, well, all the crises were sent from God because they're his will. They are not. They're sent from Satan because he's trying to take us out. There's no, there's no way that you can say, oh, well, the Lord planned that accident, you know, where I lost both my legs and and my arm. No, that's a hindrance. That was of the devil. We were robbed. Or what if family members were killed in it? Oh, well, the Lord needed some angels in heaven. What if they weren't saved? God did not plan that. That's the enemy that has tried to call, throw all of these things against us. And it's when we understand who we are in Christ, we understand all these weapons against us, but the weapons of our warfare that is, are mighty unto God to the pulling down of every lie of the devil and every opposition of the enemy. 
So that's how we're going to overcome these crises, how to have dominion in life over these crises that are going to come to everybody. It's through faith and staying in the love of God. And then the final verse of Scripture from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You notice he didn't say for whoever is born of God. Now we are born of God, there's no question about it. But we have something on the inside of us that's born of God. And it's actually our faith. For whatever is born of God, over God, born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Your faith is born of God. Why? Because we don't have faith of our own. Whenever you expose yourself to God's word and suddenly the lights turn on, God pours his faith into your heart. It's his faith that we're using. We get to use God's faith. How many think God's faith will do anything? It's on the inside of us once we learn how to tap into the resource of his faith and let his faith keep doing the work. We've already broken it down. It was when Jesus, you know, was responding to Peter, the tree you, the fig tree you cursed, you know, is withered from its root. Have God's faith. Now speak to your mountain. With God's faith, take authority over the mountains. Cast them into the sea. And then pray the prayer of faith and get the replacement to the mountain, to the problem, to the opposition, to the crisis in life. The replacement is God's solution coming in. Pray the prayer of faith. So one you do in the name of Jesus, I cast that mountain into the sea. If it's debt, if you got a mortgage, you say, well, that's a debt in Jesus' name. I cast that into the sea. Uh, anything that's uh, in opposition, you can cast in the sea. If it's a lack of health in your body because God intended for you to be healthy, you say, wait a minute. Okay, I cast this into the sea because it's not God's plan. And now, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray to, to receive by faith the provision that you have. And guess what? You're really pulling it up the inside of you because it's in the Spirit. It doesn't come down. From, sometimes it, you sense the tangible presence of the Lord. It seems like it comes down. It's really on the inside of you. I look at it as being a miner and mining it up. And there's not just gold nuggets Sometimes there's a mother load of all the provision of God, mother load of healing, mother load of peace that passes understanding, mother load of healing for your body. You just keep mining it up because it's there on the inside of you in the Holy Spirit who dwells in your spirit. It's all in there. Say, so we're not far from the hand of God. It's close as our mouth. It's in our mouth and in our heart, the word of faith that we preach. Who is he who cover, overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is only available to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Raised from the dead, received him as their own personal Lord and Savior. We're the one's position. Now again, you have to go all the way in to get the total victory. Uh, that means get saved, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Embrace the whole counsel of God's word as promises. And trust in the power of the age to come. Because when we start experiencing, like I say, when I look out and everything goes kind of blurry, and I know I'm starting to see into the Spirit, it's because that's the power of the age to come. It's like in, in a superimposition. God superimposes the kingdom of heaven on the earth. It's like he touches the earth where we are by his Spirit. And so, yes, he's on the inside of us. At the same time, he can manifest his presence where we are. There's a big difference between the omnipresence of God where he's everywhere, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit, and the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why when a number of us that have the Spirit of God on the inside of us get together, we worship God, we agree in the Word, we, we focus on the, the counsel of God's Word, and all of a sudden we say, God's here. And he is, I can testify, because things go blurry when God arrives. <laughs> Brother Hagin used to see often the glory cloud rolling in. He spoke in some bigger auditoriums, he says, but he, he, he said sometimes he would just be preaching, he'd, he'd look up, and he'd see it rolling in, in the back, glory cloud. You know, and when it hits you, it's just more power. Because he, he's walking in the special anointing, but he, something else happens when that glory cloud <laughs> comes rolling in. Something else happens when, when I look out and I start seeing into the Spirit, because I know the presence of God has showed up. He's manifested himself, even though all that power is on the inside. It's like, he, it's like he's saying, I'll make this connection on the outside with what's on the inside. You know, where I kiss the earth, I'll pull the healing up out of your spirit. I will pull the manifestation of provision out of your spirit. I'll pull peace that 
surpasses understanding about it, and I'll heal relationships. I'll do all kinds of things when you stay in that place where I can just make this your habitation. I mean, you want to live in the presence of God like this. We know we'll have that without any opposition to it, without any distraction one day. Right now, we've got to press through all the distractions, the crisis in life, and overcome these by faith. And sometimes it requires others. That's why it's okay to let other people know your needs when you're in the middle of a crisis. Say, I need prayer. I mean, I'm going to be praying this way, this thing through, but I like other people praying for me too because we believe in prayer. We believe in group prayer. We believe in a bunch of people praying, just knowing what the issue is and supporting someone. As a matter of fact, I'll just give you the, the name of the little girl. Her name is Vanessa. So please, I, anybody here, I want you praying for Vanessa. She's going to be undergoing chemotherapy right away. She'll stay in the hospital this week because that first week is really tough. They want to monitor her very closely. And um, <clears throat> so pray for Vanessa, for her to be able to have the joy of the Lord in the middle of all of this and be strong in her body and be able to, you know, go through all of this. And But for the parents, because they couldn't, you can't imagine a worse situation for a parent. And so we're going to surround one another when we have these crises of life. And we're not supposed to go things through things all by ourselves. We're the body of Christ, the family of God. We still have a lot of family on the earth. A bunch of our family is already in heaven. But man, we're going to tap into all the family that are of like precious faith on the earth and get them in a prayer agreement so that we can see great things happening from, from heaven into our lives. So I'm going to start praying. And um, I set my timer real early so that we can make sure that we have some time of prayer um, and those of you that are streaming, pray, stay in here with this, this prayer. And um, God's got some victories for you. Victory over every opposition, every crisis of life. We've seen those promises through the word. I hope you wrote those down. Go, if you, if you didn't, go to our website next week, divinehealing.faith. Now, we're, we're calling this dominion in life now. And so dominion in whatever of area of life you need to have dominion in. But... So you get those scriptures that promise us the victory. It just puts things in perspective how powerful and mighty our God is. And he's got such a history of doing incredible miracles. So, you know, he hasn't changed. I am the Lord. I change not, he says. We see from the word of God in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He still Passing out miracles to those who come to him in faith. So for every single one of us, I want us just to receive what the Lord has for us. Pray in the spirit with me for just a little bit here. And I know God is going to just pour miracles upon us because we're those who've come through crisis and we're on the other side of victory and we need some manifestations of the miracle power of God. We've already taken authority over the mountains and cast them into the sea. Now we're receiving by faith the prayer of faith the replacement for all those mountains in Jesus' name. So even if you've gotten rid of the mountain, you need the replacement to the mountain. So that's going to be something big. One day you can be able to say, I've got all the money I'm ever going to need for the rest of my life. So what, well, that's a crazy statement. No, that's from the word of God. That's the provision of the Lord. Uh, I, I have enough faith that I'll walk in divine health all the days of my life, no matter what the opposition against me, crisis of life that comes, I'll still come through on the other side healthier than before, and I'll live all my days out to a ripe old age and fulfill what God put me here to do. See, we have these promises from the Word of God, so that's the replacement to these mountains that we've cast in the sea, and then we're going to walk in love and forgiveness with everybody because we're not going to undo any part of our faith with bad attitudes or anything. So we're going to be like God. Be Christ-like and love for everybody. So we'll know that our faith is always working. Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray in the Spirit so that we're just tuned up again. We know that when we're praying in the Spirit, the most important things before us are being prayed out and sometimes the intercession for others. You're always having us, including praying for ourselves and our loved ones. But we build up ourselves on our most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you that when we come into your presence, we just sense that presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and then a tangible presence of the Spirit of the living God around us. We know that we come into a place that we want to stay, a place where it's easy for us to believe, where we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. We abide in the secret place of the Most High God. We find our habitation in you, and in that place we know. That which we see with the eye of faith, we know is ours, and we can claim it. We can receive it. So in Jesus' name, we're praying now for the replacement for all the things that we've cast out of our lives, those mountains we've cast out of the way. We've commanded Satan to get his hands off of our finances, get his hands off of our bodies. They're temples of the Holy Spirit of the living God. They were designed by you to be in perfect health. So we command these bodies to be healed and whole and to receive from you that touch from heaven that completes the healing as we're casting these oppositions to our lives, these crises out in Jesus' name. So alert somebody that's watching that was believing for transportation. And I don't even want to say car because I'm not sure what transportation they were looking for. But anyway, it's on its way. <laughs> Maybe somebody's watching from India. We have so many friends in India. Well, mo motorcycles are the sometimes the best mode of transportation there. Maybe somebody was believing for a motorcycle. That's you. Claim it. It's you've got a new one on the way. Jesus' name. Maybe some of our friends in Africa, one of our students, LCU student there in Kampala, Uganda. Thank you, Lord, there's a healing coming. It's a healing coming to somebody there in Africa because they've not had the doctors and their faith has been in you. And Lord, you're able to do more than the doctors can do in many cases. So we just thank you, Lord, for that healing in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Right here, right here under the sound of my voice, somebody that's watching here in the U.S. There's a healing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Sometimes I have to wait before the Lord because I'm receiving a healing myself because I injured myself this last weekend. And uh, I want to make sure, well, I do, I do. The Lord, I receive, I receive that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, my dear, but no, there's somebody else. And so, yes, it is. A, it's a lower back healing. It's taking place. You had tremendous pain there. And in Jesus' name, it's going. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's somebody <clears throat> that's a prodigal in, in a family, and they're on their way back. You've been praying for that prodigal that knew the things of God, was in the church, turned their back on those things and started messing their lives up, but they're about ready to hit bottom and say, listen, I'm going back to my father's house. I know the stories of the Bible. I know I'll be received. So there's a prodigal coming back. 
Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Somebody that's wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, or you actually have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you're not prayed in tongues. And the Lord's saying, just go ahead and lift both of your hands and just let it flow because I've provided it. The words will come to your mind. Just speak it out of your mouth in Jesus' name. This time it's going to be just as easy. The devil's always a liar. He say, oh, you're making it up. Oh, that's just gibberish. That's child, child gibberish, you know. No, it's from the Spirit of the living God. Whenever you have those thoughts, you know Satan is trying to rob you. Don't be fooled by him. Just go ahead and let it rip because that's something you didn't think up. That's given by the Holy Spirit of the living God. It dwells on the inside of you. Now he's just going to fill your mind. He's going to give you the tool of revelation knowledge and illumination of the scripture by the Spirit of grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, the foolishness of joy. It's one of the great blessings. Separate you right out from the crisis of life. And it produces an emotional healing. A lot of joy. A lot of, a lot of joy. Hallelujah. Joy! For whoever wants it, it's yours. Take it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's part of the power of God that gives you that joy. It comes from the fire. And it just hits you, and all of a sudden, you say, what happened? Joy just came into my heart. Cool, my dear Mando. Cool, Mando, dear Fun. These are not drunken as you suppose. They're drunken in the Holy Ghost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Oh, my steel of Mando. Oh, my Yeah, just tap in. Oh, my steel of Mando. Ah, in the man of steel of Mando. Yeah, in the middle of crisis, yes, you can have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. Oh, my steel of Mando. Oh, man, did you sting from Count it all joy when you encounter various different crises. <laughs> you can laugh in the devil's face. I got your number, devil. You're not going to get me with this one. Hallelujah. And I even spit in your general direction. I think that was from a goofy movie. God is manifesting his presence. Sometimes you'll feel like you could just reach up grab hold of part of the blessing that's just in his presence. Do it by faith because he's manifesting in his presence. Pull to your heart something that you need from his kingdom. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Spirit of Holiness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Has anybody here had a bronchial infection or anything recently? Just something that you felt in here? Oh, yeah, maybe it's streaming. <clears throat> I don't know. I just felt the presence of God come right here. Whenever I feel his presence, sometimes I realize he's touching somebody to receive a healing with somewhere in, their, in your bronchial passages or your, your breathing, lack of breathing ability. I'm not sure if you felt it in your lungs, but you felt it in the center. Oh, my dear Father, so that the Lord is touching and bringing healing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are the healer, still the healer. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Always the healer. Kush, dear Lord Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Kumandadish, dear Lord Fumanando. Kumandadamandadish. Kumandadayadadish, dear Lord Fumanando. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, keep practicing the presence of God. That's why we do this sometimes in these services. So you can, I want this all the time, Lord. Well, practice it, you know. Don't watch the news when you get home. Don't watch any other television. When you, yeah, we'll do that. But understand that uh, you can put on, put on some instrumental worship music as you're driving home and stay in the presence of God so that this anointing stays on. So the anointing of victory over all the crisis of life or any opposition of the devil. I'm going to keep that resting on us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we wait till the end of this. For those of you that are streaming with us, we go ahead and take up our offering here at the end. And we just want to invite you, if you'd like to be a partaker of being a partner with Life Christian University, that means whatever God is doing through the university and he's doing global things, incredible things on five continents, where we have graduates, over 20,000, over five continents, 24 different countries, and we've just scratched the surface. But, but if you want to partner with the anointing that's getting that done, then there's all kinds of blessings coming your way. So sow a seed and partner with us so that we can get the job done and get to more and more people, get to more foreign lands, get to more people that are hungry for the whole truth of God's word. And so those of you that need a offering envelope here, we have a basket over here with some envelopes in it. And uh, if you haven't, we also here have, uh, we want to get a good record of everybody so that if we ever have some real need to call everybody at one time, hurricane, we live in Florida, so we're preppers for hurricanes. <laughs> if you don't prep for anything else, you better prep for hurricanes when you live in Florida. And uh, we're coming into the hurricane season. So, um, but anyway, so that we can be in touch with you, sometimes we have to immediately on the last minute cancel the service because of one of those things. Uh, so we have some of those sheets you could fill out, but we have these offering envelopes that if you need one of those, uh, we'll make sure you get a tax deductible receipt at the end of the year. And, um, and of course, you can text to give. You can go on our website, of course. We have uh, lcuonline.com, and there's a place that says give, and you just follow the prompt there. And I think it gives you a way to text to give in the future, but it's tithely. It's, it's a... It's a tool that's given to you so that you can set up your bank account and it's just in anytime God says, ah, throw five dollars their way. You can just do it, you know, and um, it's a real simple thing after you get it set up. Praise God. We're just going to pray over this offering and trust God for a, a return. We want everybody to get a financial return over financial seed sown, but a return in your life of whatever you need. It's overcoming one of these crises or anything else that you need going forward to what, to meet the need for what God's called you to do. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we're sowing good seed into good soil with Life Christian University right now. We thank you for the opportunity to sow, and we trust you, Lord, that Life Christian University is going to accomplish 
what you called us to do here on the earth with it, to take ministry education to people anywhere in the world so that they can get the same truths and understanding of those so that they can be one who carries the truth. They can be disseminators of the truth. As a matter of fact, they can be super spreaders of the truth. <laughs> Instead of a virus, we're going to super spread the truth of the Word of God. And so uh, we thank you, Lord. We're going to all be equipped with that Word that's a blessing to us and to many. And so, Lord, we also thank you for a financial return that meets all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus as we partner with the university. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, amen and amen. So praise God. I hope everybody can walk better than I feel like I'm going to be able to walk. <laughs> we, sometimes we've got office chairs here. If you need a designated um, driver, we can at least get you to your car and then get somebody to enter the driver's seat. Wouldn't be you, but anyway. <laughs> or just help getting to the car, you know. I, I have had the Spirit of God. It was so funny. I was in a service one time. It was an ordination service. And we, we started to do this ordination and the Spirit of God just came in. And the pastor of the church, his son was outside this other room and he was going to come run into the room and the door was wide open. And he says, I got there and, and, he's, and he just, I mean, we're watching him and he just, he, he got there and he stopped and he says, something in here. And he just left. <laughs> and um, so we were just plowed under. I mean, it was just, it was just the glory of the Lord was there. And uh, I thought everything was fine. I drove all the way home and um, got out of my car and fell right on my face. My legs would not hold me up. I was still under that anointing. And I, you know, made it to my car. Fine. Thought just everything's good, but I'm just still in the, in the glory all the way home. <laughs> and then you find out your knees don't always do their job under the glory. So, you know, crawl to the front door, get in somehow, you know. So anyway, it happened to me. I can testify. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, we go under this anointing, trusting you that we have found our habitation in the secret place of the Most High God, under the shadow of the Almighty. And that's our safe place, the place where our faith always works. It's a place where the joy of the Lord just fills our heart continuously. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Have a fun Weekend. It's weekend for us here. So. <laughs> if you have to work another Friday, bless your darling hearts. But you'll have a good weekend anyway, so praise God.